Greetings, I'm John the Spirit, we have Moondrops to immolate, and welcome to Pi AE Super Shorts. Before we do that, however, I want to show you a basic setup for a self-sustaining burner mining drill system that takes up some space, but does make sure that your burning mining drills never have to be hand-fed. We have 7 burner mining drills, which is enough to fill up a transfer belt with 14 rock hole per second. And you can see that where I have a conveyor belt leading out of this burner mining drill, sorry the colors are so close together, we have a mechanical inserter pulling. Let me demonstrate this in action so you can see more clearly. Okay, the one flaw with this system as it currently is, is that this mechanical inserter is not pulling into the burner mining drill because the splitter is too far away, so I need to correct that real quick somehow. Okay, this configuration seems to work best. Let me just collect some coal so that you can see it in action. Alright, now you can start to see all the mechanical inserters moving on occasion and the coal being pulled. I think this looks pretty good. And you may be thinking, Jonathan, what could you possibly need this for? Are you going to start carting coal around your whole base? No, I'm using the mod Robot World Continued, so I'm going to cart coal around my base using robots. One small problem, Robot World Continued used to provide cheap logistic robots and robot ports during the early stages of Pyanodons, but in this beta it doesn't. That is a good thing though, because I don't wish to be using robots for long anyway, I would prefer to have a more robust train base, especially since I've got a lot of training in trains recently from some vanilla runs. But for this limited time until I have electric mining drills, I would like to have coal shoved into all the places it needs to be shoved, without me having to do the shoving all the time. Eh, I'll consider it. I'm not really having too many problems with hand-feeding right now. We will see. Now to get to the actual point, the production of Moondrops. To create our first basic Moondrops, we need Moondrop codexes, planter boxes, and petri dishes. One nice recent change is that planter boxes now require three ash, so we can use more of that damn ash. We do unfortunately need a lot of Moondrop greenhouses to make even a marginal amount of Moondrops per minute. 10 items per minute requires 8.4 Moondrop greenhouses. So I'm going to do some thinking to find out if I actually need that much Moondrop or how much... Because Moondrop is something that will produce methane. By the way, I'm researching optics. Methane is used to produce formaldehyde, which is used for formica, which is of course used for our circuit substrate. So I'm going to do some calculations shortly, but first I'm going to continue to show you how to get those Moondrops. Moondrop codexes are easy, just need some tin, which is a bit unfortunate because tin is one of our slowest production items right now. But then we need this thing called petri dishes. Petri dishes require agar and empty petri dishes. Empty petri dishes are easy enough, so easy that I can just switch to making them right now and hope that they come in reasonably quickly. But agar requires seaweed and steam, but the seaweed is the important part. Seaweed can be made in a seaweed crop facility, which requires limestone. We can get limestone from soil extractors. So I'm going to temporarily um, repurpose this soil extractor to produce limestone for me so I can get that for my seaweed farms. You can get seaweed to jumpstart your seaweed farms by mining it from oceans. I have enough limestone to make two seaweed farms. They are enormous. I can already fill them both with seaweed to increase their speed to whatever the maximum speed is. So all I need to do is power them and I can start getting my seaweed at an okay rate. Meanwhile, a quick boiler and high pressure furnace will prepare me to make my agar. And now I can start making agar once I get enough steam, which is happening surprisingly slowly. Producing enough methane for one circuit board per second requires not too many Moondrop greenhouses, according to the Matrix Solver here. However, I don't really need 60 items per minute. I can go with just 15, which again, drastically reduces the number of greenhouses I need, thankfully. With the help of some priority splitters, I can ensure that only Moondrop seeds get taken out of this loop and only in the correct measure. If you wanted to get both Moondrop seeds and Moondrops out of a system that makes both, there is a way I have planned to do it, which involves um, taking out only one item from the basic producing loop, for example, just Moondrop seeds, and then outside of the basic producing loop, turning the Moondrop seeds into Moondrops at will. In this case, we only need Moondrop seeds, so we're fine to just throw things down and hope it all works. The point of convenience is that we don't need to wait for too many Moondrops to get this thing going. Woefully, I just used a lot of my tin for something, I don't even know what. But in order to get lots of moon drops, I need to wait for lots of tin, so I've doubled up my fluid mining drills, and now I'm going to eat lunch. With 100 tin, I can waste it all on 5 moon drop codexes, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. For some reason, moon drop codexes require enormous amounts of copper. And we don't get a better copper cable recipe for a really, really long time. With 10 agar, we can make 10 petri dishes, and with 5 codexes, 10 petri dishes, and 5 planter boxes, we can start to very slowly make our moon drops. It's a... Oh god, 200 seconds. Meanwhile, I can serve to make 4 moon drop greenhouses. 
These two moondrop greenhouses will produce moondrops from moondrop seeds in water. When producing moondrop seeds from moondrops, you get some extra moondrops. So I'm going to pull those out and have an input priority of the left so that those moondrops get used by the botanical nursery before the moondrops from the greenhouses. This mechanical inserter is set to whitelist moondrops. While this one will pull out moondrop seeds. Moondrop seeds need to be fed first to the moondrop greenhouses before anything else. So another splitter here will have an output priority to the right. The rest of the moondrop seeds will go to two more moondrop greenhouses producing methane. However, because we currently have no way to store methane, given the tanks are a long way away, sort of, I need um, alloy smelting first, which means I need to make these electronics, I'm just going to stockpile moondrop seeds and hold off on using them in this greenhouse for a bit, especially since I need moondrops to supply these modules anyway. I've jump-started it with a couple botanical nurseries worth of these moondrop seeds. And I've distributed the moondrops evenly between my two greenhouses, and now I can distribute the moondrop seeds evenly between, well, sort of evenly. It remains slow until I fill up on moondrops, but I don't really want to make more moondrop codexes when I have such little tin. But I did expand my tin production, so if I really get impatient, I can make more. But instead, I can also just work on something else. In order to be able to create solder, we need to be able to mine lead, which requires acetylene. With the greenhouses now operating at full speed, I can expect to stockpile on moondrop seeds. Acetylene for lead is one thing, aromatics for zinc is another. It's in our best interest to store our creosote in a tailings pond, which is the best thing we have to a tank, it works for liquids. And we can make creosote from tar, eventually we'll turn the creosote into aromatics, but not until we're actually mining zinc. And instead of turning our tar into coal gas like we previously were, We'll make a tar processing unit that will turn it into creosote. The tailing ponds are apparently huge now, um, although it's very unclear, it looks like you can pull and push out of these two spots and no others that I can see. In the interest of wanting to save more space for later, I'm gonna put the tailing spawn all the way over here. Probably it's still not a good place to put it, but oh well. We've now got tar fueling up creosote now that I've refueled these burners, and slowly this will fill up to 100,000, which is a lot of thousand. Later on, we'll turn it into aromatics and deliver it all the way to this zinc patch, so far away. Thankfully, our lead patch is close enough that we don't need to deliver acetylene very far. Acetylene, by the way, is largely produced by the use of coke. Calcium carbide comes from coke and lime, and lime comes from coke and limestone. Luckily, we're producing a perfectly reasonable amount of coke, in fact, too much for our factory right now, so I can just steal that to make the acetylene. Just like I stole it to make the carbon dioxide for my moss, which I am barely using at the moment. As you can see, this is a completely unorganized mess, and eventually I'm going to need to put all these together in one big circuit-producing factory. But that day is, thankfully, not yet. Once we have solder and sap research, we'll be able to research vacuum tube electronics and start getting there. To produce our goal of 15 simple circuit boards per minute, we need a grand total of 72 lead ore, which requires a whole 5 fluid mining drills. Ugh. Thankfully, fitting them on the patch is not the problem. The problem is actually getting enough coke to support the system. Because it looks like 720 acetylene fluid per minute requires two destructive distillation columns worth of raw coal mining. That's fine though, because all we need to do is duplicate this coal system to get enough coal and then put down some destructive distillation columns. It's truly a pity that it requires 2.137 destructive distillation columns, because that's so annoying. Not fair. It's worth noting that this system is producing some excess coke, and to my great happiness, the actual amount of coke we need to run the system requires slightly less than two destructive distillation columns, so we don't need to set up too many things. One interesting and very useful thing I've learned, by the way, about the matrix solver in Factory Planner is that production levels affect the matrix solver. In my previous experience, the matrix solver had trouble when an item had two recipes you could use to create it. In this case, carbon dioxide is being um, used by Formica, and I have a recipe creating it that makes it from coke. But I also happen to be making excess carbon dioxide from this lime creator, and the matrix solver would get confused if I told it that I can make carbon dioxide from two things, which would it want to prioritize? As it turns out, if I have the second carbon dioxide producer in a production level, where the carbon dioxide isn't really needed for anything, this carbon dioxide gets treated as an excess product of level 3, or an excess product of this whole simple circuit board floor, and then that carbon dioxide can be routed into the formica floor, and it will supplement the carbon dioxide already in the formica production floor, which is wonderful, beautiful, glorious, amazing. You can see it does the same thing with coke. 
Okay, I fixed an error in the system where the system thought that I actually needed a bunch of rock, I needed normal coal to fuel some of these devices, but I'm actually only using raw coal, and that reduces the number of destructive distillation columns I need in total to just two. Which makes me happy enough. So, that said, I have a temporary setup involving these two destructive distillation columns fed by coal, iron oxide naturally being pulled out and shoved into the stone furnace, coal being pulled out and shoved into this coke destructive distillation column, I'm researching the last thing I need um, for vacuum tube electronics, which is ceramic, for reasons I'll explain later. Water will feed into the soil extractor, producing limestone, which will go into this high-pressure furnace, producing lime. Lime will go into the calcium carbide producer. Coke will get fed into the two high-pressure furnaces, and with the help of an underground belt, I can pull out the calcium carbide and pull that out. Now all I need is one gasifier's worth of acetylene. Calcium carbide will join water into this gasifier. While the slake lime will get sink hold, the acetylene will be poured into our five lead miners. There's some pipes over here transferring the acetylene between the five miners. With one more inserter to put iron oxide into this furnace, this system is good to go as soon as I figure out a way to deal with the tar and coal gas. Now, I do have a way to deal with the tar and coal gas. I am in need of quite a bit of tar because all that zinc ore needs quite a bit of aromatics. And I also need some creosote for the, I believe, the formica treated wood boards here. It's quite a lot of tar, all things considered. Now, the system I have doesn't actually produce enough tar just purely from the coal. There's also the coal gas, but there's a clever way to make more tar from coal gas and get some fuel value out of it. If you turn coal gas into syngas, you get some tar along the way, and I can use that tar to supplement the system. Ultimately, I will have some extra tar. Excuse me, need some extra tar. Where will I get that tar? Uh, I'm just gonna ignore it for now. <laughs> Eventually I'll add another destructive distillation column, I guess. Interestingly, if this first destructive distillation column is running at full speed, I'll make an extra 234 tar, which is almost enough. In fact, it's looking like it's in my interest to build a four fifth gasifier. Anyway, I'll show you what I'll do with the gasifiers later. I need to research syngas first, but I can research syngas immediately after I research vacuum tube um, electronics. Unfortunately, in order to get the system properly running, I need to perform the cardinal sin and get rid of the tar and coal gas until I have my sin gas system and everything else in the factory that needs it to use it. Because this is a whole factory thing. An entire dedicated system just for simple circuit boards. Alright, now raw coal is flooding into the system. The raw coal is producing coal, which is flooding into this destructive distillation column and producing coke. With limestone being produced in the soil extractor, we'll start getting lime. The calcium carbide is now running, and it's going to start making acetylene. And the acetylene is ready to start fueling our lead miners. We'll start research on vacuum tube electronics. And to finish off our episode with a bang, we'll destroy both of our ash-holding chests, which have are about to fill up. It's a glorious day. I have loaded up on firearm magazines just for this purpose, so that we can see the first go away. Please, now, thank you. Oh my god, yes, goodbye, the damn ash! And then the second, and I won't force you to watch all of this one. You get the very last minute, I think. Well, it's taking a while. As you can see, the health is ticking to- Anyway, we're done! Oh, I better gas vent the carbon dioxide for now as well. I promise I'll get rid- I'll stop doing that eventually. For now, however, that's it for today's episode. In the next episode, we'll hopefully be able to set up an entire system, as wild as that will be, I don't know if I'm going to do it, um, for electronic circuits, simple circuit boards. If you have any feedback, I'd love to hear it. I hope you enjoyed!